is the minister's time. And now is the time for all of you who love souls. You may see men more alarmed than they are already, and if they should be, mind that you avail yourselves of the opportunity of doing them good. Why? Because we have compassion. Let's be fair. There is a lot going on with the Brother Matt Creightons of this world and other medical professionals, Brother Andrew Call, Elizabeth Starr, I don't want to name it, Nancy Markowski, I'm naming them. All of y'all that meander in and out among sick folk. And you know, most people, they think things that are just weird, like, well, of course he's a doctor. Look how much money he makes. Have you seen malpractice insurance costs? It costs a lot to run your practice. It costs a lot to do anything in the medical field. I'll bet you that a reason a lot of them in the medical field is because they love people. Now, that doesn't mean anything other than I'm just drawing attention to the fact that we have lots of compassion in the room. And I'm thankful for you. It's a compassionate church that wants to care for people that can't feed themselves one Saturday a month. I'm thankful for that. We are very compassionate people, and I want to drive us to the simple point today that Jesus doesn't heal a leper if he doesn't have compassion. So we have audacity displayed, compassion portrayed, and now how about irony conveyed? Isn't that cute? A rhyme. That's what you get when you have lots of time in a, in a plane. You can, you can make things rhyme. Every time. So sublime. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's awful. All right, so. <laughs> Verse 43. That did not even rhyme. Jesus strictly warned this man and sent him away at once and said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone. Okay, let's be fair. Seriously. We have a man that by Moses' law has not been around his family in de probably decades. Hasn't been inside of a city for perhaps a decade. Hasn't been to a mall yeah, yeah, that version of the mall, the market, right? In a decade or more. This man is a leper, and he's not allowed to go anywhere. And Jesus says, don't tell anybody what I've done for you. I ain't hugged my wife in 15 years, and you want me to go to the priest? You see that word, however, the beginning of verse 45? Y'all with me? That means he didn't do it means he was told to do something, and he didn't do it. Yeah? He didn't go to the priest. Jesus wants him to go to the priest because it would be a good testimony to Jesus, according to verse number 44. At the end, I want to reach the priests. I want to be a testimony to the priests. Jesus says, I want the priests to see something they've never seen before. Jesus is not anti-soul winning. He wants to reach the priests. <laughs> but I'm still humored about Jesus telling this man, uh, when you pass the hundreds of towns in Galilee on your way to the temple, don't go in them. Well, he hasn't been able to because of his health for years. He no longer looks like a lion. He no longer has furrows between his eyes. His fingers are back. And his wife hasn't seen him in a long time, but from a distance. And when his family saw him, they didn't recognize him. He had to tell them who he was. And that's if they came anywhere close to him. And you want him to say nothing to anybody about his cleansing? Except a priest. A priest is only found in the temple. There were Levites at the synagogues, but the place where you go and get pronounced clean of your leprosy is the temple. You want him walking 70 miles to Jerusalem and say nothing to anybody about his cleansing? This is irony. And the reason why Jesus again tells him not to tell anyone, I think we're told over and over again because it keeps on happening. Don't tell anyone. Hey, don't tell anyone. Don't tell anyone. He shuts the demons up and he shuts the leper up. Stop telling everyone what I've done for you. And they go and says in verse 45, he told so many people that Jesus had to spend most of his time sitting on a bucket on a hill somewhere waiting for them to come to him. It seems like, I don't know, 
it seems like Jesus is asking the man to do something very ironic here. Understand that this was going to be unusual. The last time it happened was maybe 600 years ago with Naaman, but certainly 1,400 years ago, if it happened at all, if she ever went to the, Miriam went to the priest, since, since, since Aaron was the high priest, it might have made a shortcut, but anyway, it's been a long time, and this man was delayed in his obedience for what reason? Perhaps the answer to that, are you still with me? Per, okay, that's six of you. Are the rest of you still with me? All right, all right. You pay me to do this. You don't want me doing anything. You don't want me to take shortcuts, do you? All right, so I visit you all week because, you, because ultimately I don't work at Walmart and I preach ultimately because I don't work at Walmart. You pay me to do this, so I'm going to finish the mission. All right, here we go. Why is this man apparently, why is Mark at least recording that the man did in fact go and do everything other than what he was supposed to do after he was cleansed. I, I can't be sure, but I do want you to pull out your bulletin and do something miraculous. Notice only one thing. That's the miracle. Okay. Open the bulletin, look at the inside left lower corner. I, I can't be sure, but I've already told you the mystery of Mark, the Holy Spirit dropping into Mark's lap this episode to put right here between leaving Capernaum and returning to Capernaum. One story, here it is, why is it here? Do you remember who Jesus and John the Baptist are supposed to remind the reader of? Elijah. And Elijah's follow-on was? And when Elijah found Elisha, he was doing what? Plowing. Good. I heard you whisper, you courageous person, you. Right? He was plowing and he dropped a mantle on him, which was a way of saying, follow me. In Mark 1, we have someone that reminds everyone of Elijah. And then we have a New Testament equivalent to Elijah calling Elisha in verses 16 through 20 when Jesus calls his disciples. I will tell you that I think, it seems to me, that the reason this is here is because of 2 Kings 7. Follow along. Elisha said, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, tomorrow about this time a set of fine flour shall be sold for a shekel and two of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. Now look here, look here. This is marvelous. There were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate. And they said to one another, why are we sitting here until we die? Look at what they say. Look at what they say. This is audacity. This is the audacity of a leper who says, if I sit here, I'll die of leprosy. If I go and touch this Nazarene, I might be killed for breaking Moses' law. I have a choice. How do I want to die? These four leprous men in 2 Kings 7 under the, the ministry of Elijah and then his follow on Elisha says in verse 4 in your bulletin, 2 Kings 7, if we say we will enter the city, the famine is in the city and we'll die there. If we sit here, we'll die. How? From famine and, and leprosy. Now therefore come, let us surrender to the army of the Syrians. If they keep us alive, we'll live. If they kill us, we only die. Isn't that amazing? What a parallel. And they rose at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. They weren't welcome in their city. Let's see if we can go and make contact with some people that may kill us or they might feed us. And when they had come to the outskirts of the Syrian camp, to their surprise, no one was there. For the Lord had caused the army of the Syrians to hear the noise of chariots and the noise of horses and the noise of a great army. So they said to one another, one another look! The king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to attack us. Therefore, now this is what the Syrians heard before they left their camp. They arose and fled at twilight and left the camp intact. Their tents, their horses, their donkeys, they fled for their lives. Can you see it? You walk into a town where all the lights are on, the TV is going, the stove is warming up the roast, and no one is home. Street after street after street, nobody home. They heard a rumor that armies were surrounding them on every side and left the beans on the broiler and left. Burner. You don't put beans in the broiler, it's bad. Verse 8. They came to the outskirts of the camp, these lepers. They went into one tent and ate and drank and carried from it silver and gold and clothing. Can you see it? 
Oh, whoa, biscuits, sausage links. Yes, I know what time it is. Sweet potatoes with butter and brown sugar. Hallelujah. And they stuff their mercies with cash and went and hid them. They went and hid them. Then they came back and entered another tent and carried some from there also and went and hid it. Then they stop right there. They stop. They look at each other. We're not doing right. This day is a day of good news, and we remain silent. If we wait until morning light, some punishment will come upon us. Now, therefore, come, let us go and tell the king's household. So they went and called to the gatekeepers of the city and told them. Surprisingly, no one was there. Not a human sound in that Syrian camp. Only horses and donkeys tied in the tents and kept. That's phenomenal. That is exactly in the Old Testament equivalent. Elisha, under his ministry, four lepers, they find great riches, they find good news, and they realize they're not doing right keeping it quiet. For whatever you bring across that New Testament bridge and into this passage, I want you to consider how strange it is for people to be clean, freed from sin, free from sin, free from the fear of death, free from the fear of life. Sins died for it. A sinner paid for it. And we travel through years and hours and cities and stuff our wallets with cash and our plates with food. And we go from tent to tent and we make our trip one way, beating feet to the ultimate objective. And we, in defense of this leper, say nothing to the cities upon cities we pass. We say nothing about what it's like to be cleansed of who we were. That ought to be very strange to us, Christian. It should have been strange. Hear me, I'm landing the plane. It should have been strange to the listener then if they saw the leper walking off like the opening to the Andy Griffith show straight to Jerusalem. Saying nothing, whistling, never visiting people, never saying anything, never reintroducing himself as the dude who was sick and outcast. How foreign it should be to us. And so our three takeaways today from observing audacity displayed, compassion portrayed, and irony conveyed is number one, you don't have to have the what question answered to have the who question answered. Number two, you don't have to heal leprosy to be able to touch someone with compassion. Number three, you don't have to be a trained theologian slash pastor to tell someone that Jesus made you clean. Hallelujah. Let's stand together. Unless you're moving to come to the altar, please be still. You do not need to wait for the music to start to pray. If God is guiding you to have a seat, do it. If God is guiding you to the front of this auditorium to kneel at an altar or at a front pew, do it. If God is moving you to grab someone to pray with, do it. If you need to come and speak with myself or someone here at the front, please do it. It is our time to talk to God about what we heard today. Lord Jesus, bless the invitation time. Amen.
finish uh, we'll continue our study in the church in the adult bible study at five o'clock in the basement and uh i praise god for you time to close okay you come on with me numbers four number six the lord bless you and keep you the lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you the lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace amen